made twenty dollars. Amen. So, so um, we're still pushing. You know, we're still. Um, and the minute it was something, right? It was it was something. It was our first dollar, right? That we made in business, and um, I'm sure at the time we were grateful and we praised God for it and just and just kept moving forward. And so, shortly after that. Um, we started, other clients started to trickle in. Um, I had another client, um, Janina picked up some clients, and then we picked up our, our main client uh, right now, the Sunnyvale client that you guys know that we have. Um, so, but when we get the Sunnyvale client, at this point, I'm just, um, I'm really Ubering, like I'm really full-time hustling because we don't got a lot of money and at the time, we went to a revival, and Pastor Kim preached about how he built the house with just prayer. I don't know if you guys remember this revival, but he gave a testimony about how he built his house in Korea with just prayer. And I began to reflect about how pastors, when they started the church, God just gave them instruction, just pray, and the money just came. So I went on a prayer rally. I grabbed my wife, and we started praying just a lot of hours. We started praying just a lot of hours, and I was reading a lot, and God gave us the grace, the anointing. Everything was there. We were going around ministering. It was a lot of spiritual stuff happening, right? But no money, but um, spiritually it was great. And so at some point, when we're kind of on the edge of basically running out of everything, um, pastor cuts down my prayer so like one hour, and um, and basically like you gotta just work more. And he's like giving me instructions about, you know, I had to do reports, you know, financial reports and and other instructions. And at the time when he uh, cut down my prayer, I um, I was surprised by it. I wasn't happy about it, and I thought I was okay with it. I thought I would just move on and just kind of go along. But um, looking back on it, that, um, that feeling that I had in me didn't go away. It kind of stayed there. And I began to, you know, I was kind of just drew back from them. And, um, and that's when I'm, I'm going back and forth in my mind, but I'm not addressing it, right? So this happened, this was a period of like weeks where I'm, um, I'm debating in my mind, did he tell me right? Because I'm like, we're supposed to be people of prayer. I'm supposed to be praying till something breaks through and this and that, right? And, and he's basically, and at the time, like one hour, I'm like, that's not even praying. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, this is like, you know, because we fire a guy. We pray. We know how to pray here. And so at the time, I was, I was offended, you know, because I'm thinking this is not prayer. And prayer is where the power and my opportunity from God and all of this, right? And I was like, now what are we going to do? I didn't know what to do because I was really relying on prayer because I knew we didn't know how to do business. It's not like I could just go out and just do a bunch of transactions. We had been trying it, and it didn't work. So I was really praying, hoping that God would just open up something, right? And so... Uh, at some point with me uh, kind of going around the church, and I'm still coming to church, I'm working, I'm doing my thing, I'm praying, but there's this thing growing in me, right, that I'm not addressing, and there's thoughts that are coming to my mind, right, that um, where I'm debating, um, did they tell me right? I'm debating, should I just ignore his instruction and go back to prayer, right, because I'm supposed to be a spiritual person, right? And um, there's times in my mind where I would agree with them, and there's times where I wouldn't, right? I'm just, I'm just kind of going. I'm at this middle place going back and forth. And um, basically, uh, I'm still serving. I'm still speaking to them. I'm still, but I'm just a little bit reserved, right? And I'm not the type of person where I can fake that very well, right? So if I have an issue with you, I'm... I might have a hard time being all up in your face, smiley, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not good at that, right? One, one thing that I really want out of my time at this church is 
I want uh, a real relationship with God. I want to have real relationships, right? My relationship with my wife and with the people God puts around me, my pastors. I want to really know them, right? I had some encounters when I was a kid where I had fake people around me. Like I give you an example. When I was a kid, I got my first car. I had a dude that came to my house every single day, right? And over a period of time, I'm thinking this dude is really my friend. I'm thinking we cool, right? We spend all this time together. I'm driving, he riding with me. We, you know what I'm saying? Until I wrecked that car, I never saw that dude again. Never saw that dude again. I remember being shocked, like this dude was the fakest, right? So I have a personal thing about being fake like that. And I know within the church, it's a lot of Christians who come on Sunday and put on this whole thing with God and throughout the rest of the week, right? If you, if you saw him in their private life, it wouldn't be real, right? So uh, one of the things that I want out of my relationship with God is just a real, a real relationship, right? So I'm not good at that whole fake thing. So uh, the pastors actually at some point invite us um, to have dinner on a Sunday, and it all just kind of comes out. I'm back there, um, and I had a lot of things going on in my mind at the time, but the anger comes out, the resentment comes out, um, um, I'm losing my cool, right? I'm saying things I shouldn't say, right? And I wasn't sure what to think about that because a part of me wanted to let Pastor know how I really felt. A part of me is scared to let Pastor know how I really felt. A part of me wants to just be quiet, and a part of me wants to do what a good Christian would do, you know, play the whole fake thing, even though I feel this in my heart because I feel like it's safe. So I got all this going on, but it, it came out, you know. We we're sitting at the dinner table, and I'm pretty much yelling at pastors, and they were very, they handled it very well because I'm sure that could have went horribly. They were very quiet, and they just listened to me. And um, Janina is, like, tapping me under the table, like, if you don't shut up, <laughs> we going to die, <laughs> right? But I had, I had to, you know, I had to, I had to get that out, right? And I have times where I talk with God like that, but it don't come out, you know, quite the same way, you know. But when you have a, you know, that the real thing in front of you, you know, and they kind of represent how we feel about God, it's, so that's really how I felt. So at that point, I realized I have a problem, right? And they told me exactly how to handle it. They gave me, you know, testimonies and counseled me exactly how to handle it. And they didn't show, you know, like they were upset or anything. And I'm, I, so after, but after this day, I'm knowing I have a problem. I'm knowing it's on me. I know I can't ignore what's, what's going on. And so the thoughts are still there. So as I'm going through that week, that's when I really started getting serious about um, casting these thoughts away that are coming to me, right, that are keeping me in between. But when I start casting them away, I start realizing more and more how much of a hold the, the thoughts had on me because it didn't just go away. It wasn't like, you know, how we're taught, oh, you just choose. You just got to choose. So I started choosing, and the choices didn't, uh, it just kept coming back. I mean, it just stayed right with me. And I went through, like, three days where for, like, morning to night, all throughout my day, I'm choosing Right? I'm in my mind, I'm like, this is not pastor's fault. Pastors love me. Right? I'm telling myself this because in my mind, the enemy's like, pastors don't care about you. Right? Pastors, they're going to they're gonna move on. And if you fail, they're going to destroy your way and keep going. Right? And, and I'm fighting it with the right thoughts in my mind. And I remember uh, when I realized how serious it was is because um, my body was under so much stress. I was, like, tired. I think I had a cold sore forming, which, you know, stress can cause that. And I think when I felt that, I was like, wow, I'm really, like, struggling, right? And after about three days, I think, like, the fourth day, it began to lessen and kind of uh, uh, go away. And um, shortly after that, I still knew I had to apologize. I had to do something. And I contacted them and went over to kind of uh, apologize and hang out. And they were very gracious the whole time. You know, and, you know, in your mind, you expect, in my mind, the enemy is making me think pastors are going to scream at me, is making me think that, you know, it's going to be some horrible thing, you know, because I grew up with a father who beat us, right? I grew up with a father who 
you know, he would line us up from shortest to tallest and beat us all, right? I mean, we, we go down to the basement, you in trouble, everybody in trouble. It don't matter if he know what you did, if he thought you did something, or if he thought you was about, we got beatings for what we was going to do in the future. I'm not even exaggerating. He would line us up and be like, you know what? You ain't done nothing, but I know, I know you're going to do something. Like he really said that and beat us all. And my sister's like way older than me. She's still getting beat, right? So I think a lot of my issues with authority kind of come from that because I'm used to um, just a much more, just being handled in a different way by authority, right? And I'm sure it played into, you know, my relationship with God and why it's uh, difficult for me to trust God, trust authority, right? So, but they didn't, they didn't do any of that. Even though in my mind, the enemy is showing me playing out scenes that pastor's going to react this way, right? And um, so, yeah, we have a day, and I'm thinking that it's kind of done. Uh, I'm thinking that it's kind of done. And um, basically, the, um, what he talked about, the text I sent him uh, was the Proverbs uh, scripture. Where is it? Oh, Proverbs 9, 8, 10. And it says, don't even bother to correct the mocker. It says, for he'll only hate you for it. It says, go ahead and correct the wise, and they'll love you even more. And I read the Passion Translation, which I haven't spent a lot of time in, because it's can't buy it as a complete Bible. And I like to read actual books, and not on the phone all the time. But I'm trying to uh, get more into Passion Translation. And for some reason, the way you put that, even though I've read this, I'm sure I've read that since I've been in this whole situation, I just, you know, Holy Spirit just really impressed me, like, you are a mocker. Like, and it was like so, like, right here that I couldn't, because you know how we all read the Bible, and we see when the Bible's talking about mockers as other people, right? You don't, when you read that, you don't think I'm the mocker, right? When you read that, you don't think that you're these unwise people, right? Or when you read that, you put, you are David, right? You're not Saul, right? You don't, you don't put that on yourself, right? But Holy Spirit put that on me and I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't shake it, right? So I, I sent a uh, pastor, I sent him that text and I told him, and um, the reason why I use the word hate is because that's the word that the Bible used. So that feeling that I described having was hate. And I didn't call it hate. I was calling it frustration or whatever I thought made me feel better. But the Bible says, right, don't even bother to correct the mocker who only hates you for it. And basically, he, pastor, sees me in a situation. It's not going too well. We're trying to figure out. And he's trying to instruct me as God's leading him. And here I am hating him for it, right? And I was like, wow. You know, I, that really uh, kind of threw me for one, right? And I'm thinking that it's done because I'm thinking I've apologized and move on, but God is still showing it to me, right? So it must be something that God is still working out of me, right? And um, this is not the first text. I've sent pastor texts like this before because, like I told you, I don't want to be fake, right? I want to uh, uh, I want to be real. I want to be real with the pastors. I want to be real with God, right? And so... Um, if there's something on me, I will send them a text, right? And God has um, um, been just leading me in that way. Um, and I sh it should be easy for me, but it's still, it's still a challenge. It's still, uh, you know, it's still embarrassing. It's still difficult. It's still something that I know that I shouldn't feel, but you can't help always what's going on inside of you. Right. If you get offended or whatever, and I know that I shouldn't be offended, but if you're offended, sometimes you just offended. I was offended. Right. And so um, basically, uh, I sent him a text and I just apologize and, you know, for hating him and for being a mocker. And I don't think I think when I apologized to him the first time, I didn't own up to the fullness of that situation like that. Right. But if this is how God sees it, then. That's what it is, right? And it was, it was um, I think the first time I apologized, I just said, sorry for losing my temper or losing my cool or whatever, blah, blah, you know. I didn't apologize for hating him, right? I didn't apologize for being a mocker. And he, you know, they just laugh. 
You know, you said something like, oh, I thought my wife was the only one to mock me. You know, they, it, it wasn't like that. Uh, but since, um, you know, we've been going through this, you know, as, you know, um, God's been dealing with me also. And, you know, we're in the promised land. So all this stuff is, it's real. It's not out in faith land somewhere. It's affecting my real life. So you guys know, like, my car got hit a little while ago. It got hit in the front and the back, right? I got rear-ended on the freeway, and this guy was moving. He hit me hard. Pushed me into the car in front of me. Cars totaled. And uh, at the time, it was police that actually witnessed the accident. The police walked up to my car and said, you know, I saw everything. Um, you and the car in front of you slow down. This car comes up behind you, hits you, push you to the front. And I was like, yep, that's exactly it, officer. And some, they wouldn't let us get out the car, though, because we're on the freeway. Uh, they wouldn't let us talk to each other. I didn't get to take pictures. But I'm thinking, I have a police officer as an eyewitness. I'm good. At some point, that officer leaves. Another officer comes. And there's several officers, right? So I didn't see the actual time, but... Another officer, I noticed he's going from car to car, he's asking questions, and at some point I said, why are you asking us all these questions when uh, it was an officer, it was an eyewitness, and told me exactly what happened. And he said, oh, well, that's not his beat, that's my beat. So pretty much I'm handling this now. And I was like, I didn't know what to do with that, I just kind of let it, but I'm still thinking that. So push come to shove, uh, Car gets towed home, um, and God is already working because uh, before I even made plans to know what I was going to do, um, pastor already texted me that God is uh, making provision for me to get another car. So God is, even though I'm in sin and I'm angry with God and I'm angry with pastors, God is still taking care of me. God is still faithful. God is already, I didn't even get to ask Nobody to help with nothing, and I got a text that, you know, God's already making plans to get you another car, right? So, um, but after the accident, um, dealing with attorneys and pastors instructed me how to deal with it, because I never had that kind of accident. I've had a lot of accidents, but I never had accidents on a freeway or, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, long story short, the attorney is like, you got to go get this police report because that's, you know, that's like one of the main pieces of information that the insurance companies use. And on the police report, the officer who uh, uh, came back and, and was doing all the asking came back and said that even though I was in the middle, and the way he wrote up his thing, he said, because of my unsafe lane change, which I'm sure was the guy's information behind me, he was like, car number two, which is me, was, is 100% at fault for this whole accident. And I'm stunned. I'm like, how is that even possible, right? And the conclusion I came to, uh, actually just, I was talking to Jeremiah the other uh, week about it, is that was God saying, this is your fault. And the insurance companies are already working it out. Like there's a, an adjuster and he's suing the other insurance company and they're basically going around the whole police report because you can look at the pictures and see you know, the way I was hit, and, and, and uh, there's a woman's, the woman's in the front, her testimony and my testimony are both kind of the same, and the guy's behind me is like just way off. So they're working it all out, and God is going to fix the whole thing, but God is still telling me, you know, that that's your fault. So even though God is giving me grace, he didn't let me off free, right? So, um, so yeah, the car gets hit. Um, I'm going to a chiropractor because my back, I had a concussion, and um, um, they had a discipline from that whole period with uh, pastors is, I'm still not clear of it. Um, that first uh, mental fight I went through that lasted three days, right, I thought I was done with that part. Um, I actually, the other week, you know, I've Ubered like several thousand people. I've Ubered like 2,500 people, somewhere in that number. And I've never brought any of that home other than to, you know, tell my wife, oh, you know, I had this interesting thing happen today. But I had a guy get into my car the other week 
and I'm not to describe this interaction, but the stuff he said, the stuff he that oozed out was the grossest, most disturbing stuff I have ever been in in my life. And I thought because I've done several thousand Uber rides, I could just shake it off like I shake off everything else and go about my business. But again, this is several days that I was uh, uh, fighting to get this. I had this feeling of just, I was absolutely disgusted. I've never been so disgusted. And I was fighting to get that disgust off. I was so disgusted, I didn't want to be close to my wife when I came home. I didn't want to, I didn't want nothing, right? And I'm thinking I'm pretty uh, clear in that er area, right? I mean, Dean Christian touched me all the time, you know, and I don't, I'm pretty good, right? I used to, it used to bother me, and now I don't even, I don't even acknowledge. I'm like, whatever, man, I'm good, right? I'm strong in that area, I ain't insecure. But um, this guy didn't touch me, but just the stuff he said was just so disgusting. Like, and I, I would never, ever, I didn't even tell Janina the details of it, because it's just, but just, uh, getting that off of me, whatever it was. And I literally felt like he had vomited something up on me that I remember being in the car just like, ah. You know, and I know it was real because the next ride after that, I picked up a girl who ended up being, going to a Christian college, and she ended up praying for me like half of her ride home. I never had an Uber person pay, pray for me, right? If anything, it's the other way around, right? But I know that it was God immediately coming to help me because it was, it was just, ugh. But it, again, you know, I think that's all just um, whatever uh, protection we receive from the pastors and the covering, if that's just moved back a little bit, you start to get some of that stuff that, um, that they're protecting us from, right? And, um, you know, I think in our house right now, we're dealing with... Uh, Insects, what you say, war, famine, and pestilence. We got some pestilence going on. It's ants and roaches and stuff that we haven't had no issue in the house. And everybody's all grossed out by that, too. But uh, so prayerfully, we just make it through this uh, season, right? So, um, so long story short, things are um, looking up, though, uh, Things are looking up, even though God is dealing with us at the same time, right? Um, there's actually a couple things on the horizon that look just like extremely good, like everything just turn around, just like boom, right? Just pivot and turn around. Um, and I'm just coming to the place. I actually spent uh, the last few days, um, you know, it brings you to the place where you realize that all you can do is surrender. You know, I'm like... I can't, you know, I can't make the business work. I can't, you know, even my, the, the serving when we do at church, I know it's people who serve, like, way better, right? There's people that execute their ministries in the church, like, way better, you know? And um, only, only God can make all that work, right? And one of the things that God has been dealing with me with, and it's been kind of a theme that God is dealing me with, is just a religious spirit, Right? Where, and what I mean by religious is, um, you guys know in the Old Testament uh, that the high priest only once a year would go into the Holy of Holies and he had to have everything exactly right. He would spend his time in the presence of God, right? And then he would come out, and that's basically the only time they spent in God's presence the whole year. And the rest of the time they're doing their thing and they're full of idols and this, that, or the other. But that religious, uh, way of thinking didn't pan out for them. It, um, they were always coming up short, and they eventually ended up getting kicked out, right? And I'm thinking that, you know, I'm a 2019 Christian, right? I'm, I'm beyond this religious stuff, right? Um, but what God is showing me right now is that um, we have to I have to be in constant communion with God like all the time, basically. Even just coming to church on Sunday and even my daily prayer time wasn't enough. Because even though I had times where 
I was spending a lot of time. I mean, a lot of time. You know how we taught Rayma logos? I'm like, if I could just get enough Rayma logos, everything will just kind of kick in and work. But it's more to it than that, right? God is, wants to be a constant uh, 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 companion in my business, my, my relationship with my wife, the pastor, even in my thought life. You know, there's times where you're fully on board with God. Like right now, I'm sure everybody is just aware of the presence of God and you're thinking like you're supposed to. But when you, on your own, during your week, the same God is, is there. And being that I'm in the promised land now, and I'm only living by the grace of God, right? I don't have a, a job or a union or nothing secure, right? It all counts, right? That I'm with God where I need to be all the time. And God is showing me, like, anything less than that is religious. Anything less than that is just a purely religious uh, uh, attitude. I... Um, I read a book a couple weeks ago called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And it's an amazing book. I was just in awe at this guy's relationship with the Holy Spirit, right? And even though, and I was really, I was repenting to God because I, I ignore God a lot. Even though I prayed a lot and I read a lot, um, I still ignore God a lot. And I turn my back on God a lot. And that has reflected in my relationship with the pastors. My relationship with the pastors is not where I would like it to be. It's not, even though they've, um, they've allowed me a lot of uh, uh, access to them and I've got to hang out with them and speak to them, it's still, it's definitely not where I want it to be. And I think it's a reflection of, you know, my relationship with God is not um, where it needs to be, right? Um, so, let's see, where am I? So uh, basically, um, in coming and testifying about, you know, our life and the stuff we've gone through and about, you know, dealing with the issues and, and hating the pastors and repenting and, and going through all of that, um, and the pastor wanted me to testify, I had a, I had a dream about, uh, I had a dream about speaking and, and the angle that God gave me on it was a very unreligious angle, Right? Because God is trying to get me out of religion, right? So anybody know the story about Snow White? Yeah. Right? Basically, they have a kingdom. Um, it's the parents, a king and a queen. Um, Snow White is like a princess. And <laughs> I'm not very familiar with the story. I'm just giving you the gist, right? And I give you what I think God wants us to get. And basically... Uh, there's an evil queen who kind of comes into power, and she hates Snow White, and Snow White runs off, and she's living with the seven dwarfs, right? And at the end, there's a prince who comes and rescues her happily ever after, right? So basically, right? Um, you got to get out of your religious box, so you're not going to get it, amen? Um, so basically... Snow White can represent, like, this bride, right? We know that Christ is coming for a bride, beautiful, without spot or blemish, right? And that's what she can represent, right? And um, the, the seven dwarfs that she is, and the seven dwarfs were in this house, and they're, um, they're all working. Like, they actually, the seven dwarfs work very hard, right? So the seven dwarfs can represent... Um, uh, uh, people who are actually you're in God, you're serving but the, the revelation of seven dwarfs is the names right, so in the story tale they had names like Dopey and Grumpy and that sort of thing, but in God's kingdom uh, the dwarfs have names like um, Resentful Dwarf or Angry Dwarf right Chubby Dwarf I don't want to offend nobody um Whatever your issue is, right? Even though you can work very hard at God's house, right? Um, with Snow White, who can represent pastors, right? Because they're carrying God's presence and they're just, they're waiting on, on the Lord. They're ready, 
waiting on the Lord. The rest of us trying to get, get to that place, right? And so even though the seven doors are working very hard, like I was shocked at how hard they work. I tried to watch a little bit of the story. They're still spiritually stuck at a certain place because of the issues they're not dealing with, right? Issues in their heart. And, um, and this, this fully applies to me because God is still showing me it's issues in there that I need to deal with. And he's causing situations and, and, and he's put me under pressure, right? Because I'm forced to deal with the issue. I can't sit on it. I can't delay because even a delay, I don't have no savings to delay with. So if God don't give me money next week, I can't pay the bills, right? So I'm trusting God, and I got to be on point with God, like, all the time, right? So um, the seven dwarfs, yeah, can represent, you know, a person that you could be fully in church and serving, but we got to deal with those issues in our hearts. And that evil queen, right? The evil queen is... If you guys know the story, she wake up every morning and she go to the mirror and mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? Right? And the evil queen would tell her, you are. Right? And so we know that the word of God is a mirror. Amen? And so you want to bring up James uh, 1 verse 23 and 24? So I'm a, uh, I have the NIV version. It says, anyone who listens to the word, and I'm going to add reads the word, um, but does not what it says. It's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like, right? So it is possible, God is showing me, to, if you have, especially if you're in this religious state, right, where you can read the Bible, See all of the different issues that God is dealing with people, all of the corrections, and you somehow skip over that and still see yourself as this pristine person. You are deceiving yourself if you do that. And this is what basically happened to me. When I read about um, the mocker and the Holy Spirit's like, that is you. And it was nobody around. I didn't, it was... I couldn't point the finger. He's like, basically, I'm looking into a mirror, and I'm seeing issues. And any, if you're spending time with God, that should be a part of your process. If you're spending this much time in this church, and you don't understand some of the flaws that you got, you are deceiving yourself. And then... That's when the pastors will come to you. If they try to point it out, you're just going to get angry. And that's why that scripture said, don't even bother to correct the mocker because they're only going to hate you. Amen? So this is uh, how God is dealing with me, right? So the evil queen is basically a deceived religious Christian, right? And by our choices, we can choose to be in any one of those positions. I mean, nobody wants to admit that you're a dwarf, right? I had to admit I'm a spiritual dwarf, right? I'm stuck at a certain place because I got stuff in my heart, right? I would like to be Snow White, spiritually, <laughs> amen? I would like to be a Snow White, you know, I would like to, I'm praying for this encounter with the Lord, but the Lord is coming for a bride without spot or blemish, right? And you have to be honest. I mean, if I was that beautiful spiritually, he would have already came. So what's the hold up? Because I've been praying for that and waiting on that for a long time, right? So that's how the Snow White thing uh, goes in there, right? So it's for everyone to look at yourself and be honest, right? Because you could deceive yourself. And the more you deceive yourself, the closer you become to that evil queen. Where you could be in church and you're going through all the motions, you're reading and praying, but you're looking in the Bible and you are deceiving yourself, right? So you at least have to be open, open to that, right? 
Are you the salt? And I'm, I'm just being honest. Over the years, God has convicted me like this on several things, right? Nobody wants to be Eli. So I've had times where God's impressing me. You're moving towards Eli territory. You got boys you need to control. And I remember being afraid. Like, oh, that's horrible, right? You don't want to, you know. Uh, I've, I've had God also convict me. You moving towards Samson territory. You dabbling in stuff. Trusting that the, the power of God is going to be there to get you out of it. But you better cut it out because you know what happened to Samson. At some point, God left him to it. And he was, he was in prison for a long time. Right? He had to endure a very difficult season. Right? I remember God directly impressed me that. I was in the car. I never forget it. Just clear as day. It says Samson. And I remember thinking, is it this song? And I remember turning the radio off like, oh, I'm done with this. I'm thinking this about the song. It took me a long time to look back and see that was about my overall general situation. It wasn't even about the music. But my point is, um, we all have to be open like that. Right? And if you open... For God to impress you like that, you'll be open for pastors to impress you like that. And then you can be like the wise son, right? The Bible actually says that the wise son actually desires the father's discipline, right? And I'm not going to lie to y'all and tell y'all that I'm that wise yet, right? Because it still hurts me, right? Because it's, it's generally in areas where, I mean, there's some areas that if they correct me and I'm... I would love it and think it was great, right? If Pastor come told me and said, you know, you're not praying enough right now, I'd be like, Pastor, you 100% right, I'm on this thing. Let's do it, Holy Spirit. Let's get this thing going, right? But, um, you know, but it's generally going to be in an area that you don't want to hear. It's generally going to be in an area where you're in denial, right? And God is going to leave the choice with, with you, right? So, Even though I feel like, you know what, I've been here since the beginning and I shouldn't have to still keep getting that kind of discipline, it is what it is, right? I can't try to compete with nobody else's pace. Um, One of the uh, scriptures that um, I got stuck on yesterday is Proverbs 13.4. Do you have that one? So (sighs) Proverbs 13.4 basically says that the slacker wants it all, but ends up with nothing. It says that the hard worker ends up with all that he longed for. And I don't know why I got stuck on it, um, but I got stuck on it, just meditating on it. And initially I'm thinking the slacker and the hard worker is just somebody working more than the other person, right? Just, oh, I'm, and I'm, I called Janine, I said, am I a hard worker? And, you know, my wife trying to be honest, she said, well, it is some areas you could work a little harder. And I'm, I, I was still thinking in terms of hours. I'm thinking, oh, I need to work 60 hours. I need to work. And as I kept meditating, at some point, um, Delore impressed me that what he means by a slacker is not necessarily the amount of hours you work, but the slacker represents somebody that's looking for a shortcut. Right? So as children of God, we all want to be God's bride. But, and we know the, the story of Moses. We know Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, right? We know Caleb and Joshua also spent 40 years in the wilderness. But we want to be the children that just walked on in without spending that 40 years. But some of us need the time. Amen? And if it's some children who get to go in, that's their thing. That may not be my thing. I might got more issues that God need to deal with me, right? It's the reason why, even though it only took 11 days to get into the promised land, it's the reason why God uh, came to them and wouldn't let them just take that straight route. He said, because when you face war, you going to repent. And God began to take them all around, right? And so when pastors coming to me, he's cutting my prayer down, I'm like, why are you taking me all around? I know how to get into the presence of God. All I got to do is Rama Logos. Boom, 11 days. I'm in there, right? And God is telling me through pastors, you're not 
ready for that. And I was actually, um, even recently, I told you when I had the whole thing with Pastor, and I was fighting that thing in my mind, and part of the thoughts that the enemy is like, is this really the church God called you to? Is this really where you're supposed to be? Right? But God got me so in this church. If I leave this church, my wife ain't coming with me. My kids ain't coming with me. <laughs> right? If I leave this church at this point, I don't got no money. I can't go back to Kaiser. Right? So it's like all or nothing type of thing with me, right? Um, so even though I would like to do the 11 day route, I would like to be like the fire books and pray all night for 30 days and everything just open up, right? That's not the route that God has taken me. And I actually was grateful to God after I had that because I realized it's levels of warfare that I'm not aware of yet. I remember when we first started church, we used to sit around and read the fire books and we would say, Man, the people who started Pastor Kim's church, they done been to heaven and hell. They done, some of them was married to the Lord. They done had all this, and they all left and walked away. And I remember we would be like, how is that possible? And I realized it's levels of spiritual warfare, mental warfare, trials and tribulations that we are not aware of. God is aware of what it takes, but we are not aware of. And, and our simple thinking, my simple thinking, that it's just Rayma Logo so you can go on it, it's not, it's not mature enough, right? So I was actually, when I, when I saw how deep the enemy was intertwined in my mind with the stuff he's suggesting, it, I, will, I actually said, God, thank you for taking me the long way. I said, thank you for taking me the long way. Because we always read about, you know, pastors, you know, so many years of ministry, big old church, and they doing stuff that even a new Christian would know not to do. But we don't know the warfare that's going on inside their mind and how long the enemy been working in their mind. And actually, one of the areas that God is pushing me to work on right now is my mind, is my soul area. Right, because I've exercised and been on a good diet for some years, right? So my physical part is okay. And I've been reading and praying for years. So my spiritual part is probably okay. But my soul, where my mind, my will, my emotions, my intellect, right? That part of me that gets to choose is a part that I probably neglected. And that's why I don't know if you noticed, but Pastor's been sending out the stuff about Caroline Leaf. And that woman is, and she's breaking down how your mind works, and, and God's trying to educate us in that area, right? Um, even the book uh, Pastor Susan suggested about You Can't Hurt Me, about the guy who's, um, who went through all those branches of the military, and he overcame all those obstacles. And basically, he said that even though he was dealt uh, a bad hand, and he felt like other people had it easier, he had to accept the fact that if he had to pay a higher price, he just had to do what he had to do to get where he wanted to get, right? Which just takes mental resolve, where you just have to make a decision and stick with it regardless. And this guy endured a lot of pain, right? So anyway, back to scripture, I'm sorry. So slacker wants it all, ends up with nothing. The slacker, right? Somebody who wants to take the, the short road or the shortcut. It says, but the hard worker. So the hard worker represents somebody who is determined to pay the full price. Whatever it costs, I'm going to pay. However long it takes me, I'm going to work at it until I get there. That's what will turn a dwarf into a Snow White. Amen? So even though they're physically working hard, um, they still got other areas and they can't get discouraged, right? They just have to have the resolve and keep the resolve. Because remember, uh, it's religious if you only have that kind of resolve on Sunday. You got to have that kind of resolve 
all week long, all month long, all year long until God says it's okay. Amen? Amen. So um, this is kind of where God is dealing with me now about all the things I've been discussing about being religious and, you know, the stuff going on in my heart. So it's okay to be a dwarf, right? You just got to accept the fact of where you are, but you don't want to deceive yourself because if you deceive yourself about being a dwarf, then you're probably headed towards being an evil queen. And the evil queen is the enemy, right? And that person going against uh, um, God's chosen or Snow White, right? So if you find yourself going against uh, pastors, right? You find yourself angry at God. Um, you're probably headed towards evil queen territory and you need to humble yourself even if it's to dwarf territory, which is very humble, because dwarfs is very short. Amen? I actually met uh, one in an elevator at Kaiser one time, and she was the coolest, she was the coolest person. Like, she was fly, I'm not even gonna lie. She got on the elevator, like, she was like, and she was like, you know, she's doing her thing, and I remember holding a conversation, and I remember looking, just like, hey, how's it going, you know, boob? She was so cool with it, like, I'm not trying to put down dwarfs, just so you know. Um, that's not the point I'm trying to make, right? The spiritual, spiritual dwarf, right? So, uh, yeah, basically that's it. Amen? All right, thank you. So uh, anyway, let's wake up some people. Go ahead, put the picture up. All right, say uh, mocker. Mocker, repeat after me, mocker. mocker. You know, uh, when, um, if I give you instructions or correction and you get mad, then you're, you're being a mocker because you can actually start, you're getting mad at me for trying to fix you. And really, God is trying to fix you, right? And you're getting mad because I'm in, I'm invading your space, invading your idol. And you gotta, you know, some of you need to be uh, uh, going over that uh, scripture about a mocker who will hate you. And there, we do have more than one mocker in here, or ex-mocker. And that's that's that that expression is is like. I'm not happy, I'm kind of, you know, huh, yeah, okay, pastor, okay, kind of look, no? <laughs> All right, anyway, um, we're running out of time, so let's go to tithes and offering. Um, Nicole's up first with the offering song, right? Or offering flagging.
Oh. All right, we have one more. Uh, Daniel Gonzalez. I was trying to get him to sing Spanish for our Alex's family, but. <laughs> They're the cheerleaders. Uh, just them two. Baris and Tico and Sarah. All right, no more kids. Tico and Sarah, where is Tico and Sarah? And the cheerleaders. Yo, can you turn my guitar up a little bit, please? My check, my check. Like a rose. 
Okay, let's bring up the worship team. Yes. All right, everybody, stand up. <laughs> everybody, let's stand up. <laughs> All right, so where are my Mandarin speakers? Who speaks Mandarin? Mandarin? Anyone? All right, I have a question for you. You too, Lisha. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna use my cheat sheet. All right. For all the Mandarin speakers out there, say yo, go and buy Ichi Jim Bai. Woo! Ready? Okay, let me say it again, cause my accent is really bad, cause I don't speak Mandarin. <laughs> all right, say yo, go and buy Ichi Jim Bai. Woo! All right, what about say yo, go and buy Ichi Tawu? Anyone? Tawu? Woo! Lisha Tawu? Yeah! <laughs> all right, uh, let's see, all the Spanish people. So, ¿Quién habla español? Guatemala, was it Mexico? You, you? Chick-fil-A, <laughs> Puerto Rico. Where's Lisa? We got the Dominican Republic over there. All right, this is for all the todos. Las personas hablan en español? No sé. <laughs> All right. ¿Estás listo para adorar? Yeah! All right. ¿Estás listo para adorar? Yeah! What about, ¿Estás listo para bailar? Yeah! Woo! <laughs> All right, this one is for the Koreans. Yeah! Where are the Koreans at? If you eat kimchi, you're automatically Korean. Woo! <laughs> All right, for the Koreans. Chang Yang Har Jumbi Denayo. Okay, let's try that again. Chang Yang Har Jumbi Denayo. What about um, Chum Chu Jumbi Denayo? Amen! All right, now everybody, all the nations, all of us together, are you ready to worship?
Thank you, Lord. I said our God is awesome. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! All right, everybody, good job. Now, this song is called He Reigns because God reigns over everything, all right? So, you guys can clap along. Clap, clap, clap.
fear, we're optimists. No bad words for socking it. Believe in God, that's just common sense. But believe in God when the confidence, when the thoughts come, you just blocking it. This is me, ain't no mocking niggas. When the demons come and the heat is on, they know who my real father is. No light shining bright as his. And he is the king. Wait, if you ever want to see his kid, I got him all over me. Yeah, and it's got on my sleeves, it's got on my chest, got on my heart, I am part of the best. I couldn't see my destiny. I've been living recklessly. I was a sinner born to change. Now I can see the change in me. No more letting the devil come and try and take over me. Ask for help from God above, and I bet I play it safely. Worship team, I'm meant to be with all you yeah, on the side of me. I could do anything through Christ. I just gotta believe in me. Lord, keep pushing me to live life in yes successfully. All I need. So I trust in God and no one else. He made me in the image of himself. Who am I to criticize the hand I was dealt? You know my work, yeah, I know my work. Uh, Nothing can compare to the love that I felt. Yeah. You don't know God, you don't know yourself. You don't love me, fine, I love myself. I'm with my brothers, I'm finna go crazy. I've been in the struggle since I was a baby. I'm walking the hustle, I'm in the pain. G-O-G, that's how you make it. Demons been counting me out. I'm stuck in my prayer. I'm coming with word. I'm coming with scripture that you never heard. Show it with action, just like a verb. Come with obedience, coming to serve. I had to give him the peace. But yeah, I had been put through the ring. Swear I was racing for peace. Oh, yeah. yeah, I thought they got in the weed. Yeah, I cannot waste it with me. Yeah, I couldn't see it easily because yeah. I wasn't stable mentally. I was hurting down terribly. Now I see God's hands want to treasure me. Yeah. Lift him up. Praise yeah. the Lord. Ask for help. You'll yeah. never be ignored. God is the name all alone. Lord above the king on the throne. Yeah, yeah. I'm a son of God. You know we reaching the summit. Uh -huh. Any obstacle I see. Thank you. Okay, let's get ready for prayer. Some of you can take a short break. Ten seconds. Ten second break. Your word is not in vain. 
give the Lord a hand. All right, let's pray and we'll go to dinner. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for uh, disciplining us, Lord. The Bible says that we should welcome and love discipline, even though we may not ask, we may not know what we're asking. And when, when we go through it, it can hurt. But yet the word says that it will produce fruit of righteousness and peace. And we will be thanking you for it. We may not be so grateful in the process, but Lord, what's most important is that uh, you help us finish it, Lord. Go through the race, go through the season, go through the discipline. For you are fixing us and correcting us and bringing us to total surrender, total brokenness. And help us to give, give us that revelation, Lord, as we go through it. And let us know, Lord, with determination that it's all or none. There is no halfway, half a heart. It's, it's all or none with you. And Lord, help us to make it to the finish line that we may hear your words. Good job, thou faithful servant. We thank you for the tithes and offering and the dinner and your people here. May you continue to grow them, Lord, mature them from glory to glory. Even though there's many tears, many heartache, you collect the tears in a bottle, it says in the book of Psalms. It will not go in vain as long as we hold on. And Lord, as we hold on, may we make that right choice, choice which is from you and the right decision which is from you. We thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a hand.